Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Sid Gisler, the administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes. Welcome to the 97th annual awarding of the prizes. Our program is quite straightforward. Later in the luncheon, Paul Tash, chairman of the uh, and CEO of the Tampa Bay Times in Florida and the new chair of the Pulitzer Prize Board will come to the podium and address you briefly. Paul is someone who truly worked his way up, a native of Indiana and a top graduate at Indiana University. He started at the Times as a local news reporter and he rose through the ranks to become its editor and then chief executive. The Tampa Bay Times is Florida's largest newspaper. Until 2012, the, news, the newspaper was known as the St. Petersburg Times, but it's changed its name now to reflect the growth throughout, its growth throughout the Tampa Bay region. The Times is widely respected as an American newspaper. Through the years, it has won nine Pulitzer Prizes including one this year for editorial writing. Incidentally, the board has very strict rules on uh, recusal. If a member's own news organization is a nominee for a prize, the member must recuse himself or herself and leave the room during the discussion and voting. Paul is also chairman of the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, a school for journalism and journalists and media leaders that uh, owns the Times Publishing Company. In 2012, Paul received the Distinguished Alumni Service Award from his alma mater, Indiana University, and he has recently been inducted into the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame. Paul, please rise and be acknowledged. After uh, Paul shares his wit and wisdom, he will turn the proceedings over to Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University and a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board, who will present the 2013 prizes. Lee is a distinguished First Amendment scholar with what I like to call good journalistic bloodlines. His father published a small paper in Oregon and Lee has gone on to write and lecture extensively on the importance of free speech. Indeed, as Columbia's president, as an author, and as a Pulitzer Prize board member, he has displayed more personal interest in the future of journalism and free expression than probably any major university president in the United States. Lee, please rise and be recognized. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Paul Tash, and I'm the chairman of the board of the Pulitzer Prizes. And it is a profound honor to represent my colleagues on the board at this celebration of extraordinary work in arts, letters, and journalism. Let me start by acknowledging the board's debt of gratitude to our dedicated administrator, Sig Gisler and his colleagues and his colleagues on the Pulitzer staff. It is no mean feat to keep this machinery humming. The cycle that results today in 21 Pulitzer Prizes started with 2,637 entries. Sig and his colleagues tended that process as they do every year with excellent judgment, steady good cheer, and meticulous attention to detail. The board is also deeply grateful to our jurors. They are the 102 authors, scholars, musicians, and journalists who signed up for Pulitzer Prize jury duty 
As many of you know, Pulitzer Prize winners have to make it through two rounds of judging. In the first stage, the juries winnow the entries down to just three finalists in each category. As the Pulitzer Prize Board periodically reminds the world, we have the option, by an extraordinary majority, to consider an entry that has not been nominated as a finalist in a given category. Even so, we occasionally give no prize at all. For the first time during my eight years on the Pulitzer Board, we found winners in all 21 categories from among those finalists recommended by our juries. That result speaks not only to the quality of our winners, which is superb, but to the judgment of our juries. That is not to say that the board's decisions this year were quick or easy. They rarely are. Indeed, the quality of the discussion and debate is what makes serving on the Pulitzer Board such a pleasure, surpassed in my experience only by my day job and by my family. When I was elected to the Pulitzer Board, Tom Friedman welcomed me to, quote, the world's best book club. And that description certainly fits. But I have also come to think of the board as a wonderfully genial debating society. For two days each April, we gather in the journalism school around an oval table in the room named for Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The World. Without fail, without fail, the discussions reveal a deep reading of the finalists. Differences are respectful and friendly, but they are also full-throated, settled ultimately by a show of hands. Among board members, no score is kept, and no scores are settled. Any board member with a business or personal connection to a finalist is gently banished to the hallway for the discussion and the vote. You may not always agree with the result, although I doubt there is much dissent from our decisions represented in this room today. But in eight years on the board, I have never sniffed even a whiff of doubt about the integrity or the commitment of every board member to recognize the very best work. Our process is as intellectually honest as humans can make it. It is hard to win a Pulitzer Prize. This year, like every year, I left New York struck by the quality of many finalists who did not win a Pulitzer Prize. This year, that group included the winner of a National Book Award, a Harvard historian who has won the Pulitzer twice before, and a collection of short stories that won the richest international prize for such writing. In journalism, the runners-up included an expose that fire retardants in furniture are mostly worthless and toxic, but that an industry campaign of lies bamboozled government officials into requiring the chemicals anyway. Other finalists in journalism, one, triggered a review of 20,000 criminal cases based on questionable forensic science and got innocent people out of prison. Two, documented how a special police agency was failing to protect the residents of California's homes for the profoundly disabled. And three, demonstrated how supposedly nonprofit hospitals in North Carolina are running big surpluses while paying their executive seven-figure salaries and skimping on charity care. What makes this year's crop of Pulitzer finalists even more remarkable is the punishing economic pressure on most of the news organizations that have sponsored the work. 
My first Pulitzer board meeting was in 2006. That was a high watermark in advertising revenues for American newspapers. Since then, the combination of economic crisis and competition from digital alternatives has sent advertising revenues plummeting by more than half. Today, 15,000 fewer journalists have jobs at American newspapers than in 2006. People outside our wonderful racket know that the commercial enterprises that have created most journalism are going through a rough stretch. And so they ask whether the troubles have taken a toll on the Pulitzer Prizes. And the answer to their usual surprise and a little to mine is this, not one bit. The caliber of work that gets to the Pulitzer board is as strong as ever. How to account for this paradox? I think journalistic ambition burns both in organizations and individuals despite the financial challenges. Bankruptcy may no longer carry particular stigma, but it remains a sign that an enterprise is under real financial strain. And by my count, 11 of the 42 finalists in this year's journalism categories come from, come from journalists working at companies that have sought the shelter of bankruptcy protection. So do four of the 14 Pulitzer winners. You can feel the strong pulse of journalistic spirit in organizations big and small. Toward one end of the scale, Journalists from the New York Times won four Pulitzers this year. Like the Times' other winners, its entry for international reporting was hugely demanding and expensive. Beyond the salaries and newsprint it took to publish that work, the incalculable cost may be in revenue lost because the work imperils the company's investments in China a huge and growing market. At the other end of the size scale, our prize for national reporting goes to a startup with a full-time staff of seven people and a history that goes back six years. An organization with neither much resource nor history takes the prize in a category that included all the usual suspects and plenty of heavyweights. Now we are about to turn to the most important business of today. The presentation of the Pulitzer Prizes is occasion not just for celebration, but also for inspiration. That is a point I will take from today's ceremony and indeed from all my experience on the Pulitzer board. The work may be difficult. The odds may be long. The challenges may be great. So what? Every day presents an opportunity for excellence and the chance to do work that makes a great difference. Wherever we labor in journalism, let us make it a labor of love. Thank you very much. And we turn now to our gracious host for today, a fellow member of the Pulitzer Prize Board, the president of Columbia University, and a genuine gentleman and scholar, my friend Lee Bollinger.